Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, everyone. Um, can you see my slides? Yep. Okay, great. So appreciate you taking the time to join me on a Friday morning after our long open education week. It's been really incredible to see Idaho represent in the ways that it has. Um, and so some of the work we've seen this week, you know, embodies open pedagogy. And I'm so excited to be able to give you guys a, a few minutes of kind of the basics of what open pedagogy is and how it aligns with authentic assessment as well as inclusive practices. Um, and just so you know, this uh, presentation is openly licensed. So if you want to reuse it, you are welcome to do so. Um, to begin, let me just do a quick introduction. My name is Monica Brown. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And I am the OER coordinator at Boise State University's eCampus Center. In my role, I work to support online faculty and um, programs in implementing OER and open pedagogy in their courses. We see that this lowers barriers to access and helps students kind of hit the ground running because most of our online programs use a seven week model. So any kind of textbook buying delays can really hurt a student's success in a course. Um, and so we've been invested in OER for a few years now um, at eCampus. Prior to this, I was a composition instructor who also used OER in my classroom. I taught first year writing at both Boise State and College of Western Idaho. And during that time, seeing students kind of contribute to the collective knowledge of our classroom was really impactful. And so it sort of sold me in on open pedagogy and OER um, before I even had this role. Today, um, I just wanna give you a quick overview of what I wanna cover in the next few minutes. First of all, on the left-hand side of the screen, you will see a bit.ly as well as a scan a QR code that you can scan. This will take you to the documents uh, or the slide deck. Um, and I encourage you to do so, so you can follow along. I've also included quite a few um, links to resources and ideas and templates. And so it can be helpful to go ahead and follow that link and, and bookmark it for future use. The questions I kind of want to explore today are what is open pedagogy first and foremost? What does it look like in practice across a wide range of disciplines? And finally, what factors do you need to consider when you start designing open pedagogy? It can be incredibly promising, but there are some kind of structural elements that can help you have a successful open pedagogy component in your courses. Um, and so I wanna explore those today. If at any point though, you have questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, I, I'm happy to stop and answer those too as we go. We don't just have to wait till the end. Um, so as I kind of kick off this conversation about open pedagogy today, I encourage you to reflect back first on a time in your undergraduate career where you were invited into the knowledge construction process. What was that experience like and how did it change your relationship to learning and or your major or profession? Go ahead and think about this for a minute, kind of let it stew um, as we head on to the talk about the definition of open pedagogy. Um, I think it can be helpful to think about our own experiences as students and how transformative they can be and if open pedagogy can kind of dovetail with that. So what is open pedagogy? Open pedagogy is a set of educational practices designed to support um, knowledge construction for the public good. In essence, it's really allowing students to help shape public knowledge commons, of which they are also a part. Um, I pull this definition from Open Pedagogy um, on the Open Pedagogy Notebooks website. It's a great resource that kind of explores in depth how open pedagogy um, merges together all sorts of different transformative uh, pedagogies and digital critical digital pedagogies and things like that. Um, but the key here is really that instead of just having students think of knowledge as something you consume from a textbook, it's about kind of making a, recip a reciprocal relationship in the classroom where students are also able to contribute their knowledge and their understanding back to the course and beyond the classroom, which can help to make these um, more abstract things, more tangible, and help students to really own what they're learning throughout a semester and beyond. So that's kind of, a, you know, theoretical level, kind of abstracted away, like the overall goal is to help students feel like they can contribute knowledge to the discipline that they're learning about. Um, but what does that actually look like? And so I've got a few things here um, that are, to me, forms of open pedagogy. The first one might be kind of familiar to us, those of us who are faculty, um, 
It's incorporating students into the acad academic community by working to do research and present at conferences with them, whether at the undergraduate or graduate level, those experiences can often be really formative. And I often think about them as open pedagogy as well, because we're asking students to step into the conversation and contribute and not just consume and regurgitate. Um, another Common thing is to create new textbook introductions, content summaries, study guides, anything that ha can have students um, reframe and represent course content in a new way. And thus allows students to contribute what they're learning potentially back to audiences of future students, making it so that it's less of a vortex where you write a paper and it goes into Blackboard or Canvas. Your faculty member may give you feedback, but other than that, it kind of gets sucked, sucked into the void a little bit. Um, this is an opportunity for students to write for a real world audience. It can also include letting students curate course content. Many folks already have research projects as a part of their course and open pedagogy aligns really well with that work. Um, of course, another really kind of popular one that turns assessment on its head is having students write strong test questions. It's often a task that requires a lot of skill and understanding about a content area in order to do effectively, and it can be challenging um, and force the students to really think through, okay, what are the common misconceptions or mistakes that are made in this particular area so I can understand what might be viable answers to a question that I'm creating. Um, those can all be forms of open pedagogy. And hopefully that kind of takes the more abstract idea and brings it down to something tangible that we work with. So I wanna talk a little bit more about what it looks like in practice across a range of disciplines. One of my favorite projects that I've seen done is out of the University of Edinburgh. And they did this great work out of their library um, to create a Wikipedia edit-a-thon. Um, and through it, they really focused on gender inequality in Wikipedia articles. Oftentimes, folks, um, the content that is covered in Wikipedia often misses or erases um, or undermines kind of the signif historical significance of different contributors, particularly when those contributors are women or people of color. Um, and so this work, they kind of framed it as a critical engagement opportunity and students were all over that. They were so excited to be able to go in and add content that was missing beforehand. And I think it can show how transformative open pedagogy can be. It enables students to learn research skills, to learn skills in speaking to an audience beyond the university. And it helps to get that knowledge out there so that we have more work um, covering these really important figures that have been historically erased. And by framing it from this kind of critical engagement method, we help students to take responsibility for that public knowledge comments and contribute to it in a, in a way that allows them to show their strengths. And I think it can be pretty impactful. There's a link here to this article where you can learn more about how they did it and the research of the impact on their students. It's pretty incredible. Some additional examples. Um, I wanted to show some options from a range of different disciplines. So I have a course here on African, Af Af African folklore, um, creating customized course content that explores decolonization in a variety of modes. Um, there's an entertainment technology course gallery, as well as a scientific investigations open pedagogy course that allows students to kind of create a student centered website project by the end of the semester that is based on um, kind of their research over the course of that time. All of these can be really great examples. And the key here is that after students have created this content with the public audience in mind, they have the opportunity to go ahead and contribute that back to the world, whether that's just opening up to everyone or creating content that then is used for future iterations of a course in, in subsequent semesters. So um, one, last, one last slide of examples. I could geek out about this all day because there's so many creative ways to, to play with open pedagogy and I think it can be really powerful in that way. So it can span format and mode. So don't just think of it as writing or just multimedia. It can be a quite a few different options, whether that's adding to existing works, like editing or revising work, um, maybe even contributing to a class bibliography um, so that students aren't necessarily creating something all on their own from scratch. Um, there are ways to add to or revise and remix materials as well. On the right, we've got some kind of more new work, generative things. Um, so real life case studies, study guides, test bank questions, 
um, any kind of student generated tutorials can be really cool and an, another great opportunity to share it out publicly um, so that students have that real world audience. Of course, it depends on the disciplinary of the course. Um, and then the new work section is where I really geek out as a composition instructor, um, having students create new articles um, and write for future students and then being able to share that back in free in subsequent semesters. Um, so it can be new works, but it can also be revising or contributing to a larger conversation or collective work. And I often think that gets kind of overshadowed, but it can be really impactful. At Boise State, we had some great work done by Teresa Focarile to create student um, kind of generated summaries and introductions to plays that were then added to the course book over time. Um, and so every year that course book gets more and more depth to it. Um, and students get to contribute without necessarily feeling like they have to create a whole new resource on their own. So um, that's something that I think is really powerful about open pedagogy is that it's it's flexible to whatever it needs to be for your course. So hopefully those ideas have kind of gotten your, your mind thinking about what potential open pedagogy projects you already have in your course that can just be kind of refined um, or giving you some new ideas to start with. I do want to kind of walk through the structure um, kind of from an instructional design perspective as to what can make for a strong assessment opportunity. I especially like to caution us, I think as we try really unconventional and new projects, that we be aware of the potential to, um, I don't know, ma further marginalize uh, students, maybe first generation students or students who don't have access even to necessarily the traditional forms of assessment. Um, we want to make sure that as we design these assignments, they're still inclusive or more inclusive, and that we're being really explicit and clear so that students have the support they need, especially when we're working with students in those first one or two years of college where they are expected to demonstrate a real wide variety of skills that may be new to them. So I have three kind of key factors that I like to harp on when I work on an open pedagogy assignment with a faculty member. The first one is space for contribution and collaboration. This is helping students to identify and explore gaps in the curriculum. So you want to make sure that you're open and ready to have those engaged conversations about where histories have been erased or oppressed or marginalized um, and ready to engage with those because students will recognize those gaps. And when you open the door for them to, it'll be a really powerful and incredible opportunity. Um, but we do need to make sure that we're ready and we have that space to engage in that conversation. Um, the other thing that I like to think about in, in this particular category is creating um, that space that takes into account power dynamics particularly when you have students collaborate in projects. Not every student is gonna be walking into the classroom with the same sort of footing of privilege as other students. And so it can be really intimidating to have them collaborate on constructing new work um, without giving them some sort of structure to rely on in case the conversations get difficult or there's disagreement as they work collaboratively. You basically want to create community ground rules and a way to be able to step in and support students if they're not able to have their contributions heard and valued. Another way to do this is to make sure that you're creating smaller assignments in the process that help students acquire the skills needed to complete a larger project. Just like with backward design and any kind of good assessment structure, you wanna make sure that there's those check-in points for students so that they know that they have support in creating their work um, throughout the process. The second one is respect for student privacy and autonomy. This is so important because as we open up our classrooms, we have to recognize that open isn't always safe for everyone, whether students have um, privacy concerns, security concerns, safety concerns, those things are really important. And so um, a few reminders I always like to give is that to ensure any course outputs are not tied to a particular section or year because it needs to protect students' enrollment privacy. We also want to make sure that students have the opportunity to be anonymous or to use a pen name um, just in case they don't want their name attached. They are, after all, just learning. They might not have those same beliefs in a few years or maybe change their major and don't want that to be the first thing that comes up in a search result when they're on a job market. So giving students those options um, is really helpful. The other thing I like to stress we get excited about sharing our work and we kind of assume it might be the default, but make sure that sharing it beyond the classroom is 
an opt-in opportunity, not something that they have to opt out of. Um, this might mean that you don't get as much participation as you hope for, but I think it's really important to respect that students don't have to use open licenses, that they're entitled to their copyright, and that they have the safety to learn within the kind of the walls of a classroom without sharing it with the public. What I found though is when I give students those options, at the end of the semester, they often have more confidence than they thought they would, and they often really do want to share their work um, because they've heard from their peers that it is stronger than what they believed. Um, and so giving them that opportunity again to opt in at the end of the semester can be another really powerful way to boost their, their confidence as learners while still respecting their privacy and if they don't want to openly license what they've created. So um, the final thing is clarity and transparent assessment design. So I know a lot of us feel like we have to know all the copyright answers in order to do an assignment like this. You don't. Um, and I think it's just really important to be transparent with students when they have questions about copyright. I have had really good luck inviting my librarian in to talk about copyright and open licensing and um, help students understand what their rights are so that they can decide how they want to use their intellectual property, both in the course and going forward. Um, and so being transparent and clear about open licensing is really important and it can be a little intimidating. But I encourage you to be really explicit about that and um, don't feel like you have to do it on your own. There are people on your campus to support you in understanding those things. Um, my other recommendation here is to clearly kind of define how the assessment will be evaluated at the end. Even if you have kind of more of an open end pro open ended project give students that rubric or help create that rubric at the beginning of the project so that they know exactly how they'll be assessed. Um, and that can help a lot with student nervousness around trying something new is if I know ahead of time how I'll be assessed and that'll have the opportunity to check in with my instructor then I'm more willing to try something new and risky, which is what we're get, trying to get students to do, right? We're trying to get them to branch out. And in order to do that, they need to feel safe. And so making sure that they know how their assessment will be graded is a really, really key way to do that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pause real fast. Were there any questions in the chat? Uh, no, okay. Um, feel free to drop questions in the chat or if you have other ideas about what makes for a strong, um, design element in open pedagogy, feel free to throw it out there. This is only kind of scratching the surface. Okay, so I've got a lot of resources because we're only scratching the surface. On the left, I have some links to some sample open assessments, um, including all sorts of different things like having them write test questions, as I mentioned before, or creating zines or doing student collaborative syllabus design, which can be really impactful as well. We also see annotation as another tool. So having students openly annotate their resources so they can add to the conversation happening in a text can be really powerful. On the right, I have some kind of cheat sheet resources for open licensing for students. I think it's so important to have student friendly, accessible language when we're talking about copyright. And so um, these are some resources that have been shared kind of on the national level, um, slide decks, um, student release of course materials, and of course, how to have that conversation so that they know what they're getting into and can make really informed decisions about their copyrights. So that is all I have to share today in our little rundown. I've thrown together the, um, uh, the QR code here if anyone missed it and wants to scan it um, to have access to all of these links, but I have time for questions. Monica, I scanned your QR code, first of all. Thank you so much. What a great idea. Um, I'm gonna let people have time to type their questions into the chat and Actually, it's even easier if you type it into the Q&A module, if anyone is typing a question now. But because I know it takes a little bit of time, I'll jump in with the first question. Um, so I love the idea of doing open pedagogy in my class. I'm thinking about redesigning my class to incorporate those elements. But one thing that I'm mindful of is having just gone through a graduate degree of my own, I've done some project-based um, projects, I guess, yeah. that have uh, wound up as, for example, a WordPress 
site or a Google site um, or a blog post. And right. it feels to me a little bit like digital litter because I am not going to go back and use those things again. And so I really liked the point you were making about students decide whether to put it out there and it's student quality work. Um, do you have any example of students, you know, doing open pedagogical projects that doesn't just sit out there statically after it's done or how you yeah. would approach that litter? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that that kind of resonated with you because it, it's something I'm pretty passionate about teaching first year writing. Like students are, <laughs> they're in their first cor college course and they're doing some writing that might be a little rough. And so I want them to be able to learn in a way that's safe and that they don't feel like their employer might find in four or five years. Um, so the kind of response I have for that is kind of twofold. I've had students um, kind of inventory their resources. And I've actually found students to come back to the work that they've created as first year students later on, particularly in our research course. Um, and so they're able to come back and say, oh, I was actually able to use this annotated bibliography from a year ago to inform what I'm doing now. Um, and I also have kind of found it to be that, like I said, keeping those things private and enabling students to have the privacy if they want to, I think it's just really important. I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, I think you were on mute. Yeah, no, I was. I was waiting to see if other people were going to type yeah. in questions Sorry. because I tend to just monopolize conversations if I don't wait. But um, I, I just, I really, I get what you're saying. And um, because I teach information literacy mm -hmm. for nursing students, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great to give them a, a, a feeling of purpose by having them put together some patient education information, like try to make a patient education handout to feel like what they're doing has purpose. But at the same time, I don't want to take those things and actually put them on the web because, right. you know, <laughs> you know, for all sorts of reasons. Um, and so, and maybe I, it's, you know, maybe I'm not even qualified in some cases to be able to put together patient education on a topic. So I have all these ideas that then give me pause when I'm thinking, right. am I sort of unleashing um, something that they might not want to exist after the class? Does a class sometimes have to give students the space to do things in private, you know? And right, so exactly. That just resonated for me. Yeah, and another kind of thing that I, I kind of, I think of it sort of in spheres, right? So being out on the open web is one sphere that we can shoot for, but it might not always be appropriate. Um, like students write academic argument essays in my course, and sometimes the arguments are really uninformed or off base. And like, that's part of what we're working on in the class, um, but they don't necessarily need to be public on the web as they're learning that. Um, so I think of it, uh, there's another realm, which is within the class ecosystem. And so from semester to semester or cohort to cohort, students can share back with previous with the future incoming students, um, their work. And so it creates an environment where they're able to contribute to a real world audience, but it's not so public and unguarded that it's not safe for them to share that information or could be harmful information to share out. I don't know if that kind of addresses it, but yeah, I, I sometimes like to think of it kind of as like, you can have an open pedagogy ecosystem within a given course that renews itself. And we have a comment from Amber. I think also working with the community to see what they need can be helpful too. Um, she works over at path, uh, uh, OER Pathways. Um, we had a student creating a brochure for working with intercultural competence for healthcare and she talked to University Health Center and local hospitals as consultants to make sure her work would be useful. That's so cool. That's really awesome. Connecting it back to that community and bringing in community experts so that we're also breaking down those walls a bit between the university and community, I think is so powerful. Thanks for sharing that. It looks okay. like you also have a, a Q&A submission uh, in the Q&A module. Yeah. So the Q&A question, oh, such a great synthesis of open pedagogy, thank you. Um, what would you say to faculty who are worried about self-plagiarism in this pedagogical model? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've actually done some collaborations with our Director of Academic Integrity at Boise State um, because open pedagogy has a lot of really cool potential and it also kind of flies in the face of our traditional understanding of um, authorship, copyright, and potentially academic integrity. And so helping students to understand 
um, academic integrity with an open pedagogy is like probably my next most important piece of advice. I'm so glad you brought this up um, because students can self plagiarize, students can potentially even plagiarize other people's work because it is openly licensed, right? They're supposed to do it with attribution, but attribution standards aren't actually as clear as they could be right now. And so helping to make students uh, sure that they understand how to give credit to work, um, even if it's openly licensed, uh, is really important. Um, I personally, I, I, when I work with my students in first year writing, I talk to them about self-plagiarism and making sure that students understand the expectations as they go from course to course is to create new content unless they talk through that with their faculty member. Um, it's a conversation that you have to have with them because they don't necessarily know. And even as an academic professional, I often iterate on my work over years and years, all of us do. And so it can be this kind of weird line um, between like iterating on your previous understandings of things and self plagiarizing. So yeah, that's a, a huge component. I would definitely stress talking about that explicitly with students um, because oftentimes they just, they've never even heard that term self plagiarism before. Hope that addresses that a little bit, but it's a great question. Well, uh, I think my time slot is up, but if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, I'm happy to talk to anybody about open pedagogy basically all day. <laughs> so thanks for coming. Thank you.